What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. Not asking, uh, you know, how do I feel about this or how can I intellectually rationalize this or what do the studies show? You know, ultimately we're asking the question of what does the Bible say? It's a specific attack against the true God. Because when's the last time you heard someone stub their toe and go, oh, Buddha? <laughs> it, it doesn't happen. Jesus wants the rose! That's the point of the gospel! All right, and we are live. What is up, Reasons for Jesus? We are Worldview Warriors coming at you. As always, I'm Dave Wilson, hanging out with Skippy John Jansen, per usual. And uh, we got a really good episode for you guys tonight. Uh, also, welcome to everybody ch catching us on, uh, on YouTube. Um, well, if you have been following us for the last couple episodes, you will know that we are doing a series of videos on eschatology um, and just looking at end times and things like that. Um, I really want to encourage you guys to watch, especially the first video, if you haven't done that, where we just kind of define, you know, what is eschatology and, you know, and, and we just kind of look from a, from a very bird's eye view of, of sort of what this topic is. Um, and then in our last video, we had um, Dr. Kim Riddlebarger on talking about the amillennial perspective. And uh, this episode, uh, we have someone else who is going to be basically telling us everything wrong with the last video that we had. So, <laughs> so that'll be interesting. But uh, yeah, so we have some exciting stuff coming up. Um, our next episode is going to be on dispensational premillennialism, which is going to be yet again a different view from what we're presenting today. But um, you know, really, our our heart behind covering a topic like eschatology is just you know we look around, we see there's a lot of unnecessary division. I think within the body, this has yeah. become become a contentious issue, unfortunately, for some. And um, and we hope that, that by doing this, we'll, we'll kind of mend that a little bit and show that we can, uh, you know, hold hands as, as brothers and sisters in Christ and and yet maybe differ or maybe not on, on a, something like eschatology. Um, let's see. That'll probably be early November when we do that. Um, October 23rd, I'm going to be doing a debate. I did a debate on the Trinity several months back. Um, this time is, again, on the Gospel Truth, which if you don't follow that page, check them out. But we're going to be debating sort of the order of salvation and uh, regeneration and faith and sort of where where the order is there. But that'll, that'll be interesting. That's on the, the 23rd. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you're not subscribed to us on YouTube, subscribe to us, YouTube Worldview Warriors. Um, if you guys are watching us there and you're not a member of Reasons for Jesus, we want you to come hang out with us. Um, just look up the Reasons for Jesus Facebook group, and, uh, and we are there. Definitely. So tonight we have an awesome guest on here. If you haven't checked him out, his name is Craig Bloomberg. And um, just to give you a basic bio of him, he's a distinguished New Testament uh, professor, a professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary. He has edited and authored over 20 books. He said it's probably on the yeah. upward of 26 now. Uh, and those include the historic reliability of the Gospels, interpreting the parables, and a number of commentaries on books of the Bible. Um, we're going to be talking to him uh, as far as his book, uh, especially on a case uh, for historic premillennialism. And he's also just done a tremendous amount of great work on the reliability of the New Testament. Um, so without further ado, we are going to bring him on in. So just give us a second here. All right. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much for being with us. This is uh, this is a treat. This is a treat. I'm very much looking forward to it. So uh, just to kind of get us started, um, have you always held this position um, from the start of your time kind of getting into theology, or has it kind of changed uh, and shifted throughout time? Well, I was brought up in what today would be uh, an evangelical Lutheran church in America church, and um, not sure I ever heard the idea of a millennium as a kid. Um, I came to really own my faith for myself uh, in a Campus Life Youth for Christ club in my high school, and then was nurtured considerably through Campus Crusade for Christ in college. Mm -hmm. And although I didn't know the terms, uh, basically, for those seven years, I was taught uh, pretty classic dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. And then I went to uh, seminary and discovered there were other views um, and really had to make a decision for myself and read some of the books that were available at, at that time uh, that presented the different views. So it really has been since uh, my days at uh, 
Trinity Evangelical Divinity School back in the late 70s that I would have considered myself a historic premillennialist. Okay, very good. Um, so if you could just kind of define for us what that what that means, what does historic premillennialism uh, look like? What are sort of some of the key tenets uh, within that position? Well, premillennialism uh, means that uh, Jesus comes back, the second coming of Christ takes place pre before a millennium, which is the thousand year period uh, described several times or mentioned several times described throughout Revelation chapter 20. Um, Premillennialists can take that as uh, a literal thousand years, or sometimes they simply take that as uh, symbolic for uh, a long period of time. Uh, it was a round number in, in ancient Greek, just as it, it's a round number for us. Mm -hmm. But historic is a, a term that nobody would have used in the early church because there was nothing else to compare it with. Um, when uh, a man by the name of uh, J. Nelson Darby in around 1830, uh, an Irishman who also uh, traveled for a while uh, and planted churches in Scotland, um, developed uh, an approach to interpreting the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation based on seven periods of time in which God acted a little bit differently uh, among his people on earth. Those were called dispensations. And so the name that stuck to uh, Darby's uh, new view was dispensationalism. And because he, like people in the early church, um, believed that Christ was coming back before a millennium, uh, if you really wanted a mouthful, uh, you referred to Darby's view as dispensational premillennialism, practiced saying that a few times fast. <laughs> um, but there was a new twist um, that, depending on who you're interviewing next week, and whether they or the next time you do the dispensationalist uh, approach, if they are from what is more recently been called progressive dispensationalism, they they may acknowledge that uh, this is uh, somewhat of a new development. But uh, if they are like um, a number of 19th century supporters and early 20th century supporters, they may say, no, no, this is just going back to uh, the second, third, uh, fourth centuries of the church before Augustine mm -hmm. um, really put amillennialism on the map and that dominated for uh, the better part of church history. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, once people were reacting to dispensationalism, uh, a number of folks said, hold on a minute, um, you've added something new you've added this idea of a secret rapture of the church. Um, you've added the notion that God's people will be uh, taken from the earth prior to uh, the period of time that uh, in different scriptures is referred to as the great tribulation just before Christ returns. So to create another mouthful, people were saying dispensationalism is actually pre-tribulational as well as pre-millennial. Um, and people could not find that concept uh, unambiguously taught in the early church. So to distinguish the classic view from the earliest centuries uh, from this new dispensational approach, people began to speak of classic or historic premillennialism, which is actually post-tribulational. Now we've got everybody completely confused. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> very good. Um, so with looking at something like the tribulation, so most dispensationalists would be uh, pre-tribulational dispensationalists, so they would see uh, the church being raptured or taken away 
and then there is this period of time as the tribulation. Now, when you look at something like the tribulation, do you see it as a seven or a three and a half year period of time, or do you see it as more just something symbolic spanning the church age, more like a like an amillennial would see it, or or how do you understand that? Some some of uh, some of each. So in Daniel chapter nine, there is a famous passage about. Uh, 70 weeks of years being prophesied uh, before the completion of everything that uh, Daniel is being shown. And that is usually understood as uh, symbolic for uh, a much longer period of time that um, maybe was a literal 490 year period culminating in the first coming of Christ mm -hmm. um, or that 69 weeks uh, take us up to about the time of Christ and then there's a, an unstated gap and the 70th week the last week of years seven years refers to a, a seven year period of tribulation right before Christ's return What's interesting is that in the New Testament, um, and particularly in the book of Revelation, there are no references to seven years. Mm -hmm. Revelation talks about three and a half years. It talks about 42 months. Do the math, that's three and a half years, 36, mm -hmm. 12 times three plus another six months, mm -hmm. or 1260 days which in a calendar of equal 30 day months is yet another way of referring to three and a half years. So every time um, the book of Revelation, and it's primarily in the middle chapters, uh, chapters 11 through 14, where uh, you get this reference, it's just three and a half years. Um, to get seven out of the book of Revelation, you have to assume that at some point uh, two of those three and a half year periods of time are to be taken sequentially mm -hmm. and that you're to add them together. Um, I don't know how much detail you want to go into, sure. but I, I do not do that. I take it as three and a half years. And as with almost all the numbers of Revelation, um, these are not just randomly generated. Here's something that's for five somethings and another one at nine and another one at 23 and so forth. The vast majority of the, the numbers in Revelation are multiples of seven or 12 or 10. Mm -hmm. And they very clearly have symbolic significance, seven being the universal number, going back to the, the first week of creation sure and uh, 12 being a number for israel um going back to the 12 tribes of israel mm -hmm. and so seven would seem to be uh the number of completion yes well whatever else three and a half is it is obviously half of seven mm -hmm. uh, and i take that to mean mm -hmm. that tribulation the the particularly difficult period for people who are on earth prior to Christ's return is not God's complete word. In fact, I some it works better technologically. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we are back. We are all streaming and all good to go. Sorry about the hiccup, guys. Yeah, we were just saying, usually we only run into tech issues if we are covering demons or cults, uh, which we've done some of both in the past, and uh, that's usually when the issues come. Uh, okay, so where were we? Uh, we were talking about the tribulation. The tribulation. So um, I think what you were getting at is you were talking about how you see sort of the tribulation as sort of a general description of the church age, but then something more specific towards the end. Is that correct? That's right. Um, if if you look at the two things that Revelation uses, the three and a half years or the 1260 days or the 42 months to refer to, it's either the period of time uh, starting from in Revelation 12, um, when 
Satan, the, the dragon, tries to snatch uh, the woman's child that has just been born, mm -hmm. which is a, a pretty uh, clear reference to Christ's birth. Um, from that point forward, which would therefore refer to the church age, or it's uh, a period of time uh, culminating in his return. And either way, it's not literal three and a half years, but it's a way of saying, this is only half seven. This is only half the perfect number. This mm has -hmm. not got final plan. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so when you look at sort of, I guess, your, uh, not timeline, but your sequence of events is in terms of how you see things unfolding. So you see an intense, uh, growing intensity of, um, of tribulation leading up to the return of Christ then? I do. Okay, and then at Christ's return, what happens, or what what are maybe some things? If there's things that lead to uh, the return of Christ, how how all does that work out in terms of your uh, chronology there? I well, guess Revelation has uh, as its backbone three uh, series of seven judgments that are referred to as seals, and then trumpets, and finally uh, <clears throat> bowls of God's wrath, and right when you have all the armies of the world amassed uh, ready for the, the one and only time when the word Armageddon appears in scripture in Revelation 16, 16, then John decides to take a commercial break and tells us in chapter 17 about the uh, destruction of the great evil end times empire and how horrible they were and then expands on that in chapter 18 uh, to talk about how wealthy they were and how they had abused their wealth only to finally return to the armies amassed in chapter 19 um, and I think it's verse 19 and that's when Christ returns from heaven and he slays his opponents in a moment there's no long battle to make a movie about mm -hmm. uh, it's over in a flash and um, then that leads to the punishment of the three different um, entities of the trinity if you like of ungodly beings of the dragon and the first beast and the second beast also called the the false prophet so you have the vanquishing of God's enemies as Christ returns, and then that moves seamlessly into chapter 20, which sets up this thousand year slash very long period of time. Not yet of perfection, but of Christ reigning on earth and providing uh, a better world than we've ever seen before. Hmm. Okay. Very cool. So then there's that reign for a thousand years. And you mentioned before that some are more specific on, I know like dispensationalists tend to be very literal with understanding, okay, this is a thousand years. Um, it's not 999, it's not 1001. How particular on, are you on, uh, on being literal when it comes to that, that age? Not. Um, it's, a lot, it's a round number for a good long period of time. Mm -hmm. It could turn out to be literal but there's no reason it has to be. Okay, okay, cool. Um, and then so at the end of that, there is basically another fall. Is that how you, how you sort of see things, another fall and then another battle? Well, there is the release of Satan who has been uh, chained in the abyss during that period. And um, it says in Revelation 20, verse seven, Satan will be released uh, from his prison will go out to deceive the nations. Um, it's not a fall in the sense that sinless people now opt to be sinful. Um, and I don't think it's uh, something that believers who are alive at that time, true believers are going to do. Um, but apparently there are unbelievers also. And uh, what is remarkable is how the, the picture is that people just rush and flock to the devil and completely apart from all the different um, debates over eschatology um, in a world where the whole idea of eternal punishment 
is uh, as unpopular as it's ever been mm-hmm. in history, and and understandably so. Um, C.S. Lewis's uh, famous remark, uh, I think, rings very true that if the gates of hell are locked, they're locked on the inside. Well, somebody says, you mean people could be experiencing uh, eternal punishment and if they had the chance to get out, they would not want to? I don't know, but I read here on anybody's eschatology a picture of people who have just experienced the most benevolent and direct reign of Christ for the good of the earth ever. Mm. The moment they get a chance, they want to go back to Satan. I I just think that's incredibly telling. That is. That is. That's quite a picture of uh, just human depravity and and things like that, for sure. Um, Okay, so now to kind of back up just a little bit. So at Jesus' return, so we have the the enemies of Christ are vanquished, uh, judged, things like that. And then what of the unbelieving? Is that a point where, or sorry, what of the believing? Do believers then get glorified bodies at that point? Or do we go into heaven to participate in sort of a, a spiritual type reign? Or what what happens to the believing at that point? Well, this is where the, the critics of all eschatological systems say you can never find one text that puts it all together. You wind mm-hmm. up having to go to, to different texts. Um, if you go to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, it would seem that uh, believers get uh, resurrection bodies. The, the language is that those who are not alive are raised from the dead and they are raised uh, incorruptible, imperishable, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, which suggests that they get resurrection bodies at that time uh, and live in this millennial kingdom, which is a foretaste of, and in many ways, very much like new heavens and new earth, but just not quite the whole package. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then, so again, so kind of fast forwarding, I guess, to where we were. So there's the thousand year reign of Christ. There is the unbelieving gathering to Satan as he is released from the pit. And then there is sort of that, that final judgment. And then what, what follows after that? You mentioned the, the new heavens and new earth a second ago. The, the only group of people who, uh, in none of the biblical texts that deal with this, who are mentioned, um, as being dealt with at Christ's return are the unrighteous dead. And so it makes sense that what is called the great white throne judgment, because John sees Jesus on a great white throne, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, is uh, that takes place after the millennium is dealing with that last category of people. We know the destiny of the believers dead and alive we know the destiny of alive unbelievers now we have the the fourth and final category of the the unbelieving dead um who are consigned to uh, the lake of fire uh, another name for hell and again i don't take that as a literal lake last time i checked you can't have literal water and literal fire and nothing else happening in the same place. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, then chapter 20 ends abruptly and chapter 20 begins marvelously. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth Mm. and goes on into this beautiful picture of a completely renewed universe where there is nothing imperfect or sad for believers in any way, shape, or form. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, so what, uh, what if any, or what, I guess, is the, the role or significance of a future or, I, I guess, could be potentially current state of Israel right now? I know that's, especially with dispensationalism, there's a lot of things really focused around Israel, uh, Christ ruling from 
uh, Jerusalem and things like that. Uh, how much of that would, would be true of your position as well? You find historic premillennialists disagreeing on this, which simply reflects the fact that in the first three centuries of church history, you find disagreement on mm -hmm. this. So there isn't uh, a perspective on Israel that necessarily follows from being a uh, historic pre-mill. In fact, technically, there isn't a view that follows from being um, dispensational premillennialist, but almost everyone there, because that whole system of thought was built on a very literal interpretation of scripture, mm -hmm. will then take Israel as uh, being uh, rebirthed and all of the promises of the Old Testament that weren't fulfilled at the first coming of Christ will then be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, I see from Romans 11, um, 24 and 25, 26, um, that there is an outpouring of faith in Jesus as Messiah among literal Jewish people um, in conjunction with the events uh, immediately preceding Christ's return. Um, but I see nothing there or anywhere else in the New Testament that says that has to take place or it only takes place in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not a supersessionist. I don't see the church as completely replacing Israel uh, because there are some unique uh, promises for Jewish people, but neither do I see them necessarily as having to take place uh, in a, a part of the globe that is at that time occupied primarily again by Jewish people. Okay, so you wouldn't say that uh, that in order to fulfill the land promise to Abraham, that Israel has to possess this certain geographic boundaries laid out in uh, Kings, is it, I think? Um, would that be true? Yeah. You, you wouldn't necessarily have to see that as a specific fulfillment of that. Well, okay. I, would, I would actually take a, an approach that um, has been written on by a handful of Messianic Jews that has been called enlargement theology. And it takes its cue from some of the things that Jesus said, like uh, to the Samaritan woman in John 4, oh. uh, where the debates, are you going to worship on this mountain or right. uh, the one in the area? And it <clears throat> doesn't matter if uh, two worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And, and the way it can be explained is you can say that the Jewish descendants of Abraham will get to inherit the land. Mm -hmm. But the New Testament says all believers are descendants of Abraham. Right. So Christians can inherit, uh, Gentile Christians can inherit the land of Israel also. And then you have Christ saying the meek will inherit the earth. His followers will get the whole globe. So both Jewish and Gentile Christians in a millennium and in the new heavens and new earth get, get it all. Mm. So yes, literal Jews who believe in Jesus get the land, but so do others. And both of them get the whole world. Awesome. Amen. That's good. That's very good. Um, okay. So sort of contrasting your view with an ah or post millennial view. Um, so a mills and post mills will see Jesus sort of inaugurating the kingdom uh, at his first coming, and then this age is the kingdom that is then consummated at his second coming. How do you break down? Like, would you agree with them that the kingdom is here in a now and not yet yep. type sense, or, or how do you Absolutely. how do you break that down? Absolutely, George Ladd, uh, a generation ago, uh, who taught for many years at Fuller Seminary and died an untimely death in the early 1980s. Um, popularized for, for many evangelical Christians, this whole idea of inaugurated eschatology. And he liked to say that if it wasn't for Revelation chapter 20, he could have been an amillennialist. <laughs> um, I'm not sure it's quite that simple for me, um, but I, I appreciate the, the, the spirit of the remark. And uh, I don't find uh, debates with 
amillennialists productive uh, because we have far more things in common uh, than we disagree on. Mm -hmm. But the, I mean, one response is a literary response, and that is the amillennialist pretty much has to take the beginning of Revelation 20 as a flashback so that the binding of Satan goes back to what Christ did at his first coming, uh, often tied in with his um, declaration in Luke 10 that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Right. And then the thousand years becomes the church age, and then the final release becomes the, uh, the final battle. It's just Armageddon uh, from a different vantage point. Mm -hmm. that, that is very satisfying theologically. The problem is that the number 20 in our Bibles, in mine it's five lines from the bottom on page 1350, has got to be one of the worst chapter breaks that anybody <laughs> ever liked because Jesus returns. We're told what happens to the first beast. We're told what happens to the second beast. They're both thrown in the fiery lake. And anybody who's read through the book knows that there is a third member of this diabolical triumvirate, and that's Satan himself. And they're saying, what about Satan? Well, read one more verse. <laughs> <laughs> and now you have, I saw an angel coming down of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon. If you're not sure who the dragon is, he's that ancient serpent. If you're not sure who the serpent is, he's the devil. If you still don't get it, he's Satan. All four names are given there and bound him for a thousand years. Oh, and threw him in the abyss. So that's a good, long, but still temporary confinement. It's foreshadowing that there's more to come. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a seamless literary narrative that deals sequentially with the punishment of the, the three um, unholy Trinity members. And the only way for amillennialism to work is to put in a, a flashback that I just find literarily uh, entirely unwarranted. However, on the grand scheme of the top 50 things I want to contend for for my faith, that's not, <laughs> that's not on the list. Sure. However, I think there is something to be said for the argument that God created this heavens and this earth, Genesis 1.1. And throughout Genesis, we're told seven times he created it good. And he created humans very good. Is God's creative purpose going to be thwarted? Is he just going to discard this all and start all over again, brand new, and said, well, that didn't work. Let me just start again from scratch. Or is there something very powerful about saying God wants to demonstrate to the principalities and powers, not to mention human beings, that his original creative purposes will be fulfilled and he will renew this earth mm. and make it once again a kind of garden of eden and okay. yeah that then moves in terms of imagery very nicely into revelation 21 there certainly is overlap between the goodness of the millennium and the goodness of the new heavens and the new earth and i understand that the amillennial approach basically accomplishes the same thing by saying, no, the, the new heavens and the new earth, that uh, vindicates God's creative purposes. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really do it for what he actually did create. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like that. Honestly, I think that's probably my favorite, my single favorite argument for uh for your position is just seeing that God's creation is fully vindicated. It is fully restored before we move on to what's better. Um, I do. I like that a lot. Um, okay. So with, with revelation, how would you say 
you understand the book of Revelation in general, not necessarily to get into specifics, but you've mentioned a lot of the symbolic numbers, um, you mentioned these sequences um, and things like that. Do you take it more of a, like an idealist type perspective where it's more of just it's just using this figurative language to describe uh, some other type of realities or would you see it as more of a literal uh, chronology of events or how would you how do you approach that? I would combine in increasing order of importance the preterist view at least to the extent that much of the imagery requires us to understand Rome and what was going on in the first century. Yes, Nero. With and, the mm -hmm. idealist view, which says the kinds of battles between good and evil that we see here are played out in every generation in different ways perennially, but then more so than either of those two with the futurist view that says at least from the time of the, the judgments, at least after we get done with chapter five, um, we are looking at things that will, there may have been some precursors to them. Clearly there were, there were Egyptian plagues way back when that look a lot like some of the trumpet and bull judgments. Right. But the complete fulfillment of Revelation 6 through 22 is still future from our perspective today. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. The so, one that I don't take and try to work in is the historicist, which says mm -hmm. uh, you can find, particularly in the seven churches of Revelation, but some would do it even beyond that to uh, signs of seven stages of church history. Right. <clears throat> I remember as a high schooler going to um, a all Illinois state Christmas convention and hearing Jay Kessler, who after he quit Youth for Christ was the president of Taylor University for many years. I think he's with the Lord now, but uh, he gave a brilliant exposition of the historic viewpoint. And I had my little miniature cassette recorder going and I devoured that thing and I came back home and I took notes on it. And then I went to seminary and I heard people say, yeah, you can make that work if you ignore 90% of what else was happening. <laughs> right. And I go, oh yeah, I guess you're right. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. And it, you know, and I think doing it that way too really kind of jades a lot of your understanding. Um, you know, like I, I, I know a lot of people who, who will try to try to work that in and it's like, well, so, you know, they'll say Sardis, for example, was sort of the Reformation era and it's, you know, it just really clouds a really negative grid, you know, that you're sort of forcing onto that history. And, um, yeah, it's, well, what, what's attractive about it is the best of the seven churches is the second to the last Philadelphia. <laughs> mm -hmm. The worst of the churches is the last. Laodicea, <clears throat> and every era of church history, people are able to look at certain things right. and think this is the worst we've ever been through and selectively remember the good old days. Yeah. And so that, that pattern of from the best to the worst is just very popular. I mean, it's not even just something limited to, to religious people. Socrates lamented how uh, the youth of his day had fallen so far from the ideals of his youth. Um, so once you got those two in place and then somebody comes along and says, well, I can help you with the other five, you, you've already got some momentum going. For right. <laughs> Easy to just keep the ball rolling. So okay. you just gave us kind of the way that you understand Revelation. Um, coming from like a post-millennial view, they typically go to Matthew 24, and uh, kind of you mentioned the preterist type of viewpoint. How does the uh, historic pre-mill view as far as Matthew 24 and the subsequent verses? Is there certain things that you take in the preterist form and then other things you're looking forward to the future? or uh, How does that view differentiate? I am very happy to follow uh, the late R.T. France, who in a number of writings, including a, a wonderful pair of commentaries on Matthew, uh, says that 
chapter 24 starts with the disciples observing the literal stones on the literal temple they could see across from the Mount of Olives. And the only way to make sense of Jesus' response that one stone is not going to be on another is that he's talking about the coming literal destruction of the temple that in fact happened in AD 70. Mm -hmm. And so um, you look at all of these things that are predicted, um, famines and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and the increase of wickedness and the love of most will grow cold. And most of those appear at least once in the book of Acts and those that don't you can find Josephus telling us about examples mm -hmm. of them prior to AD 70. <clears throat> Must we assume that 2414 is the only outlier? Well, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole oikumene. Mm -hmm. The known world, as it often was used in the Greek language, as roughly contiguous with the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And Paul comes along and single-handedly thinks he's going to fulfill that. Um, we don't know for sure. That... Uh oh. It looks like it's frozen again. Okay, hang on. Hang tight, everybody. Oh, oh there we are. Time, yeah. Okay, there we go. All right, cool. On my end. Okay, very good. Very good. We're still here. <laughs> We're still here. We're still warriors. And, uh, and, and Paul seems to think that uh, he says, I preached the gospel all the way around from Jerusalem to Illyricum, which is basically the, the far boundaries of the Greek speaking eastern half of the empire. And he wants mm -hmm. to go on to Spain, which would from Rome to Spain would be the Western and more Latin speaking parts of the empire. Hope he had a good translator. <laughs> um, but, uh, that, and he wasn't the only one doing it. He's just the one we know the most about. Sure. I think it's, it's very likely that Matthew 24, 14 was fulfilled in mm -hmm. that representative sense, um, to all the known nations. Um, I don't think it has to include the Native Americans because sure. um, mm -hmm. nobody knew about them. Uh, and, and therefore, you can take everything up to the abomination of desolation, verse 15, the desecration of the temple by Rome and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, exactly as a preterist would. But then let's not follow preterism all the way okay, or... Oh, I think we have Still with us? Can you hear us? Okay, we... Oh. <laughs> Gosh, why? Ain't tight. Okay, I'm assuming no one can hear us right now that's live. Okay, let's see if we can get back in. Okay, we're reconnected there. Let's see. Okay. Okay, sorry guys, we're uh, getting them right back in here. Okay, there we go. Sorry again about that. We are, I think, back. Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so you're saying we don't want to quite follow preterists all the way there. Because then you wind up having the return of Christ be an invisible return in judgment in AD 70, which I just right. don't mm -hmm. think fits at all well. Okay. Now, and then, so sort of, but then to get to verse, what is it, 34, where again, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So how... Uh, just exegetically, do we sort of separate that final return and judgment of Christ from the events of, of 70? By reading verses 32 through 34 together. Okay. Or let's go backwards from 34. All these things, all these things what? 
Well, verse 33 says, even so, when you see all these things, I don't think that's a difficult interpretive principle to suggest that all these things in 33 is the same as all these things in 34. Okay, well, oh, okay. all that did was go back one verse. So what are the all these things in 33? Go back to 32. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it or he, either Christ or his coming, is near, right at the door. It makes no sense to say, when you see that Christ has returned, realize it's a sign, know that he's near, he's he's going to come in a moment. Oh, okay, I see. He's already come. So the signs, the only way to make sense of 32 and 33, are the signs that the chapter has described described as preceding Christ's return. It can't so the signs leading up to verse 29. Right. Okay, I see that. Okay. All right, I like that. <laughs> That's good. Glad to hear it. That's very good. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, obviously, each of the various positions is going to have some opposition to it and some objections. Um, and I'm sure you've heard a ton of them. But as far as uh, for your position, what do you think is the best argument against your position? The one that's kind of like, no, nah, that one is a tough one to kind of get around. <laughs> that you have, uh, well, there are two. I don't know which one I would rank uh, higher. One of them is so uh, disembodied bliss in heaven, as we traditionally call it, um, awaiting Christ's return and his bodily resurrection. And after all the perfect marvels of heaven, you're going to throw him back on earth for a thousand years in what is pretty darn good conditions, but still short of perfection. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the answer to that is that most of us are closet Gnostics and we don't appreciate that we were created as embodied people and as wonderful as perfect conscious happiness in disembodied form might be, it's not perfection. It's not what we were created for. Um, and so Resurrection body is what we were created for. Resurrection body and a millennial life is better than heaven, but still not new heavens and new earth. The the other major, you can decide which one of these is a bigger objection. Uh, the other major one is, so you're telling me that people with resurrected bodies are going to be walking around with mm -hmm. unbelievers who don't have perfected, transformed bodies, because they're never right. going to get them. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of... But... Did you freeze? Nope, you're still nope, there. there we are. Um, but I would say, well, it already happened once. When mm -hmm. Jesus, With Jesus. resurrected body, walked around, and some not yet resurrected people saw him. And if you take that strange little three verse segment in Matthew 27, 51 to 53 about the resurrection of some holy ones from Old Testament times who came out of their tombs after Jesus' resurrection. And then we hear nothing more about them. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm -hmm. if, if, if you take that as uh, foreshadowing, to use Paul's language, first fruits of the general resurrection of all people, then there were several people wandering around in resurrection bodies mm. among sure and regenerate folks. Is that weird? Yeah, that's super weird. <laughs> right. But there's some weird stuff in the Bible. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, raising a floating axe head from uh, the Elisha back in Second Kings pulled off. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Um, now, one uh, argument that a lot of my dispensationalist friends think is is an uncrackable one against uh, against your position is the problem of populating the millennial kingdom. 
So the argument basically says, okay, so if at Jesus' return, the wicked are destroyed and the believers receive new bodies, who is there to then be deceived and rebel at the end of the age? And who is actually there being ruled over during the millennium? I don't believe it ever says all the wicked are destroyed. You have 1919, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies ah, okay. gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. And nothing I have ever read about any culture, ancient or modern, ever equates an army with an entire nation. Um, the army is the select group of fighters that comes out of the nation. Those are the ones who are destroyed instantly. Um, presumably, all the other people of all those nations are still alive. Okay, okay. So it's just a select group that's wiped out at the coming of Christ, and not not something not something global. Okay, cool. That uh, that I think answers that pretty well. Um, another one would well, be your, just your friends must have a reply. It can't be that easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming they would go to. I'm trying, there would have to be another resurrection passage where it talks about um, just the judgment at Christ's return. Probably, yeah. They, they would have to go to, yeah, go to one of those other texts. Okay. Um, sooner, now, sooner or later, sooner or later, you have to go to other texts, but the goal should be for every verse, interpret it in its immediate context for as long as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. before you go punt and go somewhere else. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, now, another one that we have, more of an objection from the amillennial perspective, would be how does the millennial kingdom fit with the two-age model? Um, so that would be one thing. They would say, okay, well, there's the present age that's the age of physical things and um, and marriage and, and things like that, and then there's the age to come that's the age of eternal things, whereas you have the millennial kingdom seems to be sort of an intermediary period. How does it How does it fit in with that? Great question, um, and it's not one that's unique to uh, to premillennialists because uh, back in oh I think it was the 1970s uh, the Dutch Reformed scholar Anthony Hochma mm -hmm. wrote a book on uh, from uh, a millennialist point of view, and he said that actually the millennial. Mm -hmm. oh, Shift it off again. Let's see. Set it to connect automatically. Is it not? Set. No. Okay, man, I'm sorry about these issues. I don't think we've ever had, no. had anything like this. My goodness. Um, Okay, cool. So you're referring to uh, Hokeman's uh, work on right. the, uh, on that, who, yeah. Who equates uh, the millennium with the new heavens and new earth? So it it didn't really catch on, but it made a splash in its day, and and uh, I think the the important thing is, yeah, the millennium is a transitional, is a description of a transitional period that every perspective has to wrestle with. Okay. Um, do you say it's the extension of the present age because it's not yet the final state? I think that's what most people would say. Um, and that's why most ah mills would equate the millennium with the church age. Mm -hmm. And most pre-mills and post-mills would say, uh, no, it's a distinct period. But if you have to put it in one of two ages, it's part of the church age. Um, but that's not the only way you could take it. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the book that my colleagues, um, Dave Mathewson and Sungwook Chung uh, produced in 2018 uh, on models of premillennialism. There's actually five different forms of premillennialism. Okay. There's classic dispensational, there's progressive dispensational, there's historic or classic premillennialism, there is an approach that Dave Mathewson has built on a handful of people, the least known, which he calls thematic 
premillennialism that basically mm. says the thousand years is not about a length of time, but it's about how much the saints are vindicated. So the thousand is a big number for, oh, these other people were having their field day for three and a half years and seven years. Oh. And now the redeemed get a thousand years. <laughs> and none of those are necessarily lengths of time as they are just- Almost uh, just quantitative. Yeah, quantitative. Interesting. Qualitative. But then there's also uh, a number of recent Korean uh, theologians, including my colleague who teaches systematic theology, Sung Wook Chung, um, have been developing uh, that they just called Eastern Asian premillennialism or something like that. I don't know hmm. if anybody outside of South Korea has actually ever supported it or not. Um, but it's the idea that um, actually there are no unbelievers in the millennium. Okay. And so you do have, um, as it were, I forget how you phrased it a little bit ago, but uh, you kind of resurrect people only to condemn them again at, at the end. At the second, okay. And, and, and um, be, because the, for them, the oddity of having uh, resurrected and unresurrected people together is just too much. Um, so, okay. All right, cool. Pick from. Very good. All right. Well, we have one final sort of, a, well, I guess it's kind of, it's, it's a two part, but uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, referring to as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive, uh, but each to his own order. Christ the first fruits, then it is coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end where he delivers over the kingdom, um, destroying every nation, rule, authority, and power. He must reign until he's put his enemies under his feet, and his last enemy is death. Um, Okay, so one is, and I guess this would be almost more of a, of a dispensationalist for, you know, where do you fit the millennium in, but you've kind of already answered that. Um, so I, I guess it would really be just the, the second point there would be, so this is alluding, of course, to Psalm 110, Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. But here, um, Paul is saying that he's ruling until his, um, until death is defeated is, is sort of the way that Paul's applying it. So it would almost seem to be that under a premillennial context, we would say that Christ is ruling and reigning now, and then he continues to reign differently when he comes back to earth, and then after the end of that reign, it's not until then that, that death is defeated. So it seems like there's a change of rule right. from a... Um, right. so, so how would you, would you reconcile or understand that? Um, you just said it, yeah. That okay. <laughs> That, that would be flawless, but I would actually um, make one other point, and it's, it's really interesting because uh, I am not one of these people that wants to perpetuate uh, a rivalry between biblical studies and systematic theology. I know why some have, have pitted those against each other because of some abuses, mm -hmm. um, and whenever I see a new commentary on first Corinthians, among other things that I'm curious to look at, it's what they do with, with precisely the, the verses you've read. Um, Walt Kaiser, who was an Old Testament scholar by profession um, and taught at Trinity when I was there before moving on and being president Gordon Conwell for many years after that, actually convinced me and I keep reading, I, I keep looking for an argument against it. And I don't find one. I just find people dismissing it as a comment that theologians make. But in verse 23, each in turn, Christ, the first truths, got it. Then, then when, not immediately, than when he comes, which now has been shown to be a significant interval, though by the standards of Psalm 90, it's only been two days since the day with the Lord is about <laughs> years. Right. Um, when he comes, those who belong to him, then, and those two simple uses of then are two different words 
epeta and eta in the Greek, which when used in a context where one of them contextually has to denote an interval of time often, not always, the other one will also. Okay. So to me, the most natural way, even though Paul doesn't come out and say it, is then after another interval of time, the end will come. Okay. Interesting. That, that makes a lot of sense, though. Yeah. Yeah, so there's that potential to just kind of crack that open for, you know, could fit or not fit with, um, right. with, with yeah, what, what those other texts say. Okay, very good. Well, I think, uh, I think that really kind of sums up our questions there. Oh, we had one yeah, question. We did have one question come in uh, from one of the viewers. That was an interesting uh, one. Yeah, and what they had asked, let me see if I can pull it up here. That was Angela that asked it that, was wasn't it? It was Angela, yeah. Angela was awesome. Essentially what she <laughs> asked. Question, Angela, very well done. <laughs> what she essentially yeah. asked was, um, uh, out of all of the various views, do any of them use sources other than the Protestant canon? Uh, she said uh, she was wondering if there were any things within Jewish writings of the time or any uh, extra biblical sources that were kind of yeah. looked at. And, and it's interesting because it's not the Roman Catholic supported Old Testament Apocrypha that really says much, much of anything relevant to the millennium, but it's what some of the works in what is called the pseudepigrapha, Jewish books written in between the testaments that nobody ever canonized, but they, they were never put forward as if they should be canonized. They were just other works spanning all the different literary genres we, we know of. Mm -hmm. And in second Baruch, and fourth Ezra, you get um, clear uh, pictures of a millennial kingdom. And then in the early rabbis who wrote down after Christianity, but often relied on earlier traditions that had circulated by word of mouth, you get another five or six texts and the millennium is 400 years in a couple of them. It is 70 years. That's always a nice number in one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's 40 in one of them. It's a couple of other multiples of 100. Um, and, and they all seem to be very intentionally symbolic in picking a significant number of completion. Four also is the four corners of the earth. So, right. so that reflects universality. Um, but talking about the one in second Baruch is, is the one that goes into the most detail and it talks about how many, uh, thousands of grapes will grow on every grapevine. And, uh, this is also when they slaughter and eat behemoth and Leviathan, those two great monsters. Are they the hippopotamus and the crocodile? We don't know. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it is just an amazing feast. Fascinatingly, one of the reasons that uh, premillennialism fell on hard times among some of the church fathers was because some of the Christians jumped on the Jewish bandwagon. It's like, this is just about utter hedonism. Hmm. Uh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty much the only question that we got from our viewers that were uh, uh, watching us tonight. Relevant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all Everybody right. Everybody else uh, said, "Wait, I'll I'll wait till they edit it and get rid of all this stuff." <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. This yes. is uh, this has been very cool. Um, then yeah, very very interesting conversation. I've uh, I very much loved this. I think our I think our audience Good. has as well. Well, thank so. you. Again, thank you so much. Please continue doing your thing. The the works that you've done are are really a gift to the church. Um, really, just some fantastic stuff. Uh, oh, one quick question: Where can our viewers go to learn more about you or to get more uh, info on you or more of your content? 
you can find a brief reference on the Denver Seminary website under um, faculty, and it's easy to remember. It's www.denverseminary, all run together, .edu. Or if you want to be overwhelmed, just search for me on Google or Amazon. <laughs> it's really boring because all you keep seeing are books. But, right. Uh, <laughs> all right. Very good. Anyway, I do, uh, when people actually ask me to introduce myself, I do like to say I have one wife, two daughters, and three grandchildren. Okay. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of the right number that you ought to have for each, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, this has uh, this has been a treat. Lord bless you and your ministry too. Thank, thank you. you. You as well, sir. Grace uh, and okay, peace. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, guys, I hope that was uh, enjoyable for you. Uh, that was fascinating for us. Um, again, if, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and you're not part of Reasons for Jesus, come hang out with us uh, in Reasons for Jesus. And uh, if you're watching us on uh, Reasons for Jesus, come subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's lots of fun. Uh, keep an eye out for our next stuff. Like I said, I'm doing a debate in a couple of weeks on the Gospel Truth. That'll be sweet. And uh, we got more eschatology going on. Those who love his name spread his fame is the policy.